Notre Dame is number one. Notre Dame with a miracle win is a He's going in. Notre Dame has scored. Start with a brief uh, recap. Uh, we're happy to be 2-0 uh, against a, a Big Ten opponent this past weekend in Purdue. Uh, got an opportunity to uh, spend a lot of time uh, reviewing the film, and, and uh, there's certainly some uh, great performances individually uh, to point out, uh, but collectively as a team, we, we did not play you know, our best football. Uh, there's a higher standard for the way we should play offensively, defensively. Um, but again, I, I will tell you that uh, anytime you beat a Big Ten opponent, you're pleased with the outcome. And so I don't want to... Uh, um, and I told our team this, you know, winning is not easy. And, and we found a way to win the football game, but we've got a lot of work to do. So as we move into the Michigan State week as a, as a form to preface that, uh, the focus is on what we do at practice today. You know, we're excited about um, Michigan State uh, and what that challenge brings, a top 10 team, um, one that is a perennial a top 25 team and a challenger for a championship every year, national television. Those are all exciting, but the fact of the matter is we have so much work to do on our own group uh, Coaching-wise, player-wise, um, developing our football team that, uh, for me, the most important thing is practice today and getting out there and, and getting a chance to, to work on a lot of the things that uh, uh, are going to go towards winning consistently and especially against a great opponent uh, in Michigan State. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Brian, uh, Everett has put up some pretty good numbers in terms of third down conversions and completion percentage. What do you feel like are the keys to him sustaining those numbers throughout the season? Yeah, as, as we talk about Everett Golson's development, I think there are two areas here. One, uh, physically, uh, and, and physically playing the position, we're really pleased with him. His numbers point that out. I think he had really one bad throw, which was on a, a slot route that he kind of missed Robbie Toma. But physically, he's doing really good things. We saw his athletic ability, his escape ability. We saw the incredible athletic move he made coming out of the pocket to score a touchdown. So physically, we're pleased where, he, where he's at at this point, And it's living up to what we thought he could do. But we've got a lot to do with the mental part of the game, the quarterbacking uh, and the fundamentals and um, all the things that go along with that. So I agree with you, and your assessment is similar to ours in that the physical elements that he brings to the position are quite exciting, and they're backed up by numbers. We've got to continue to work on the mental part of it. You had a pretty tough, some tough individual matchups on the offensive line last week. You're going to get them again this week. Where do you feel like the offensive line is? What did you learn from last week about that unit? Well, again, we, we weren't, you know, in a great position to run the football most of the time. Um, I think in retrospect, we could have done a better job as a staff in, in, in finding ways to just lock some runs in there and, and get after it. Um, but, you know, clearly we're, we're going to have to play better up front against, you know, Big Ten opposition, and in particular Michigan State. And our guys are capable. Um, we're... We still feel like we've got a, a, a very, very good group. Uh, we did get um, beat on some individual uh, moves, but um, again, we think that uh, as a group, and I know Coach Heastamp believes that that, that group together uh, can get the job done at a high level for us. Did the injuries kind of play out like you thought they would Sunday, and also the group of Golson, Tate Nichols, Danny Spahn, any news on them? Yeah, they did play out the way uh, we had hoped. So we feel like the, the number of guys that were uh, out of the game are, are going to be back. I think the big addition would be Danny Spahn. He's been cleared to practice today, which should clear up that, that drop position for us a lot better. We can go back to our original plan of counsel and Spahn at the drop position uh, and get and, and you know that, that would be the hope moving forward that we're able to stabilize that drop position now with Danny back. And finally from me, speaking of the drop position, does Michigan State, without giving away trade secrets, does Michigan State's formations, the way they play, lend itself to the drop being on the field a lot more? Um, it has, but I, I will say, you know, for example, the USC game. 
you know, USC had run a lot of two back tight end. They come out against us and spread. Uh, so, you know, we're preparing for that, but we also know that we have to adjust in the game plan. Brian, uh, Graham Couch here from the Lansing State Journal. How are you? Good, Graham. Uh, How are you doing? Good. Uh, one of your impressions of Andrew Maxwell when you watch him on film and, and also Le'Veon Bell? Uh, very uh, strong arm. Uh, you know, uh, he's got good vision. Uh, tall guy that can see down the field. I, I really just think it's game experience that, that um, he's, he's gaining each and every week. You can see there's a lot. There's a, there was a big difference in his play from week one to week two, I'll tell you that. And you can see that he's gaining some more confidence. Um, they put him in very good position uh, to run the offense. So I think what we're seeing is a guy developing his, his confidence and experience from week one to week two. Do you watch the, the film from 2010 this week? And does it get any easier to stomach at the end if you do? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't watch that particular uh, set of circumstances. Um, you know, I, I think that... Um, we know playing at Michigan State and playing them last year, it's, it's going to come down to a couple of plays. And, and it probably will uh, this year as, as well. So um, I think our focus has strictly been on, you know, each and every play could make a difference in the game as evidence in 2010. When, in 2006, when you were left Central, there was a, a realistic chance that you could wind up in East Lansing. At least that was kind of the, the rumor at the time. When, when you go there in 2010, weeks like this, do you ever think how life could be different for you still, or do you ever think about that? I, you know, that, ha that was so long ago for me. My brain is full of so many different things now. Um, I think if I'm on a golf course in Michigan and making the turn and having a hot dog, maybe I'd think about it. But other than that, I'm focused on, on what I'm doing right here. Lastly, um, just out outside of the Notre Dame community, there's always a perception that this program can't be what it once was. Are there, in your mind, dynamics, be it culturally, be it academically, otherwise changes in college football that prevent that? Or, or can it be 88, 93, things of like that again? Well, certainly I'm here for, for one reason, and that's to graduate our kids and win a national championship. So uh, you'd have a hard time moving me off that spot. Whatever other people think and perceive, uh, that, that's up to them to think. But I believe that we have all the things in place here uh, for us to win a national championship. And, you know, we believe we're building our program towards that end. Thank you. Yeah. Brian, to your right, you mentioned some good individual performances. I assume Lewis Nix at times was on that list. Is his next step that kind of down-to-down -down consistency? It, it seems like when he would have one bad play, he'd come back and make two giant plays. Just he following. was terrific. He, he was one of those guys, you're absolutely right, that uh, played at a championship level. And, you know, that's what part of the challenge to our football team is to get all of our players to play at a championship level and on a consistent basis. You know, again, we had a few guys that, you know, didn't play up to the standards uh, that they have set or we've set for them. Uh, Lewis is one of those guys. Uh, Zeke Mata was, uh, was outstanding. Um, you know, you got to understand he's, he's got some young guys out there as well. Not only does he have to get himself in the right place, he had to get three other guys lined up as well. And you probably saw him running around there doing a heck of a job. And those two guys in particular played at a high level. It's now consistency in performance and getting everybody else to play at that high level. The last five quarters uh, in overtime against Michigan State, they have about 23 yards rushing against you after they started out your first year with a lot of success. Is that kind of just how this team has developed? You're comfortable playing in these knockdown, drag them out games. They had success against you in the second half defensively last year, too. Yeah, we know what kind of game it's going to be. It's going to be a physical game. You can't win close games unless you play good run defense. There's no chance. You know, you're, 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 you're going to find yourself on the short end of most of those games. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there are some games where rush defense didn't factor in, but we've built the program and started to build the program and the foundations for it on good run defense. And games like this are, are going to test you because, uh, you know, both defenses are, are very stingy as it comes to running the football. Ryan, you're using a lot of young players in key situations this year. And on Saturday, a lot of those young players played for the first time in Notre Dame Stadium. As you graded out the tape, how did they play as a unit? Well, all of the young players uh, gained valuable experience as it relates to 
you know, potential distractions on game day and all the things that go along with that. So I would say more than anything else, it was a good learning experience for him. Um, there are some things that maybe we could have done a little bit better in preparing them. But having said that, all of them competed. There's not one guy that didn't go out there with a, a competitive edge to them. Now there's some things that we can do a little bit better in streamlining communication, uh, all the things that go to being a better football player. So it was a great experience for him and one that we look to build on now going into a, which is going to be a, a very loud and, and uh, you know, a great environment at Michigan State. Brian, back over here. Um, Mich the Michigan State's upset with itself the way it played last year. I feel they got pushed around, out physical. How do you feel like you, your guys played in terms of the physical aspects of the game last year, and what do you try to carry over? I know a different year and everything, but what do you try to reach back to to bring to this weekend? Well, I think it's it's still it's still going to come down to winning up front in this game. I think the team that can control the football, minimize the turnovers, um, is, is going to be the team that has the best chance to win. So if Michigan State can exert their will on both fronts, the offensive line and defensive line, I think we probably know how that game's going to go. We feel like we have to be able to exert our same kind of presence on both sides of the ball and, and then do all the other things that require you to win. They're so stingy on defense, you've got to find a way to get some big chunk plays because you're not going to go three yards and four yards. You're just not going to build a consistency on offense to doing that against this kind of defense. So, you know, finding opportunities to get some matchups that uh, we can get some bigger chunk plays. And I'm sure they feel the same way about our defense. There's a lot of similarities that both of these defenses are very stingy. And trying to find those big chunk plays, I think, is really going to be important in this game. Sierra and Theo kind of being your, your, your combo back there this week. Yeah, I'm sure for a while you thought, okay, here's what we were going to have with those two guys. Now that you have it, what do you think you have between those two and the individual things they bring yeah. to the back? Versatility. I mean, great versatility. And as I mentioned before, I think I even said this uh, um, uh, on my uh, my conference call, was that we got to get George, you know, some more touches as well because we think we've got really three backs that that have equal starting ability. You know, they all can be stars and starters. We've got to make sure that we integrate them all into the offense. And um, they're – I think the answer to your question is it gives us great versatility. Now that you've presumably had a chance to talk to Everett, maybe you hadn't so much when we talked <coughs> on Sunday, what message do you give him this week you know, in terms of, like you said, we're going to tell you what we mean. So what, what did you tell him in terms of what to expect on Saturday? Well, I, I think it's, it's kind of what I said in, in, the, out, in, in, the, in the, uh, the initial question of Everett is, when you look at the film and you see him and you go, wow, physically he does some really good things. We want him to clean up the other areas, the communication, um, you know, getting in the right play, all of those things, which he's very capable of doing. We just got to make sure he takes that next step. And that next step is today. It really is. Because Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, then I'm done. I can't coach him anymore. You know, you're, you can't do a lot of coaching on Saturdays. So today, Wednesday, and Thursday are really important days in the development of, of uh, Everett Golson. To your left, um, did you get any clarity on the officials and the way they handled the the uh, allowing the defense to get their substitutions in after you made substitutions? Yeah, the the the, the word we got back and, and the definition within the rule itself is a reasonable amount of time. I guess when you take that word reasonable, we felt like it wasn't reasonable. Uh, they seem to think it was reasonable. So uh, we have a difference of, of opinion as it relates to that, which, uh, you know, you, you, you would think that there's a universal code across the board, but um, we, we made our adjustments that we need to make, and we're fine. We'll move on from here. As far as the offensive line and them focusing in on what their responsibility is, is their attention – diverted somewhat by having to make sure that they're on the same page with a young quarterback? No, it's, it's, it's really just, I, I think it's mostly on the quarterback and, and Braxton. You know, those two guys have got to be, you know, locked in relative to cadence. And, you know, is it a verbal cadence? Is it a nonverbal cadence? As you know, we're using both. And especially when you're at home, now, we'll have a less of an issue on the road because we wouldn't have much verbal cadence at all because it's going to be so loud. Um, 
So that's really where we have to clean it up. The rest of the offensive line, they're, they're, the communication is really good amongst, the, amongst that group. And I think you briefly um, mentioned this the other day, but you, you had your base defense in in Purdue's tying touchdown drive, second and 23, third and 10, fourth and 10. Are you more comfortable with that personnel on the field in, in the matchup, or is it a matter of you not being quite comfortable yet with throwing some younger guys out there in multiple DB? No, we, I mean, we had our what, what is our base defense, which is our bracket defense out there, and we would have been in that in most situations, even if it was a two-point play. And we had a bracket, you know. It's a three-on-two bracket. We had three defenders for their two. Um, the rules of bracket, one guy's inside out, one guy's outside in, one guy's over the top. If two guys want to be outside in, uh, that creates a problem. So we feel really good about the scheme and what we're teaching, and, and we just have to execute it better next time we get in that situation. And are you more cautious about maybe running a guy back out there now, with a, a, particularly with a head injury? But you, you had so many guys get banged up. I'm not sure if any – they were cleared, but several of them were cleared by Sunday. Yeah, to so being more cautious with injuries. In no, this I, I, I really think that there's a protocol, Tim, that's in place that takes it away from the coaches to even have a question as to whether this guy's able to play or not. We, our medical staff uh, takes great care of that. There are steps that they must follow before he can be signed off on to even get on the field. So, and I think that's a good thing because I'm, you know, I. I do the best to give you the medical information and injuries and updates, but I certainly don't want to be in a position where I have to evaluate whether somebody's good enough to go on the field. So we leave that to our a, a very good medical staff. Thank you. Coach in the front, could you talk a little about Le'Veon Bell, what you've seen and the, the kind of challenges that he presents to a team on a pretty much a regular basis now? The challenge is that he plays, and he plays every down, and he keeps coming after you. He's relentless, uh, physical, and uh, just, you know, he's just a – I don't know if this is fair to him, but he's just a throwback. I mean, he just keeps keeps going, and the more carries he gets, the better he gets. And um, But – you know, that's typical to the kind of runners that Michigan State has had. They're recruiting those kind of guys that just keep pounding the ball at you. And he can catch the ball out of the backfield, and, and he's, he's the complete back. You talked about working with Everett's communication this week. Um, going on the road in a loud environment, is it tougher to get the play in there, or because you guys use more signals, is it actually easier in that regard? We hope it's easier. It has been historically for me to be on the road. And, uh, but we'll obviously do all the things necessary. We'll have crowd noise piped into practice today. You know, we'll go with some silent indicators. We'll make sure that our communication is streamlined. We'll do all the things necessary to make sure that it doesn't. My, my track record has been such that on the road, we've, we've handled those situations pretty good. Um, but we'll have to work on them as well. And as far as the amount of work he's gotten in the two-minute offense, how much is communication a part of that, and how much more does he need? How much more work does he need before you'd be comfortable putting him in, in in a situation like you had last week? Well, I think he's he's work in progress. You know, he's he's somebody that's had two starts. You know, and was on scout team this time last year. So, you know, he continues to get better. He's you know we expect him to start and finish the game. Uh, we don't go into the uh, the week with any thoughts other than he's going to start it and he's going to finish it for us. I guess maybe I, I might not have asked it the right way, but I guess what I'm getting at is, is the amount of time it sometimes takes him to get the play in, is that what prevents him from running that right now? Uh, some something? of it is, is, you know, housekeeping, if you will. You know what I mean? Getting the play, getting it communicated, um, all those things, which he's learning. And, and he's saying it for the first time. He's looking at it and going, wow, it took me seven seconds to actually get up there. Maybe I need to, you know, speed up my... Housekeep, I call it housekeeping, you know, getting the play, you know, verbalizing it, getting everybody set and making sure everybody's set. So it's just, you know, I'd rather be doing that than, than worrying about whether my quarterback has the physical ability to play the position. Brian, up here, you mentioned kind of chunk plays. How is 
Devaris kind of delivered in that department for you this year? And I guess you could just evaluate what you're getting out of him through two games. Yeah, he's coming on. You know, he's maturing every day. He's understanding what it takes to be a frontline guy and a starter, taking care of his body, coming to practice, all those things. And he certainly has the physical ability to do that, and, and he showed that on Saturday. But, you know, I would put him in that same kind of uh, thought process as it relates to understanding all the little things that he has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But, no, he's going to be an exciting player, and he's um, – you know, obviously, uh, this past weekend, he, he got a chance to taste some success, and hopefully we can build on that. Is he somebody you're going to be able to practice today with the ankle? or kind of uh, We'll be very careful with him today. Most of his stuff today will be, you know, probably stretch and move around in some individual. But we'll be, we'll be cautious with him today and, and hope to pick it up a little bit more on Wednesday. Did he have one of those high ankle springs that last forever, or is it yeah, just a regular? I, we had him in a boot on Sunday, you know, which we, is a pretty typical way for us to go about business. Uh, and we'll, we'll get him out of the boot today and, and start, to, um, start to move him around. It's so hard to say. You know, Cam McDaniel was in a boot on um, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of last week. And, you know, he, he finished the game pretty good for us. Just curious on the, on the two-minute. You've, you've played multiple quarterbacks in the past – you know, some necessity, some by choice. Have you ever had a situation where your starter is not your best guy for your, for your two-minute offense? The circumstances are different in that you have a veteran quarterback that has been down that road before, and you had uh, a guy that's trying to get there, and somebody was already there. So I don't know that I've quite had a situation where I've had a guy – you know, generally, my stops along the way, you, you, you didn't have enough scholarships for three guys on scholarship at quarterback. So number two was not a better option than number one under any circumstances. So it's just a little bit different that we have somebody with that, you know, experience here at Notre Dame that came in and filled in quite well. But, no, I, we don't want to break the game down to starter, middle relief, and closer. You know, we want one guy to start and finish it. In the time you've spent with Everett since Saturday, how have you seen him kind of respond to, you know, really probably getting pulled for the first time in his football career? It's you know just sort of a different experience for him. Uh, you know, again, I, I think everything's transparent. We talk, you know, every day, and and he knows what he needs to do to continue to get better as a quarterback. He's committed. He's competitive, um, and and he'll he'll continue to take those steps this week. I know you loved all the punt return questions last year, so I'll be the first one to ask Thank it this you. year. Thank you. I was you, hoping. <laughs> do you feel like you have a better handle on that, or is it is it some of it you got a freshman back there and he's getting acclimated? What's what's kind of your feeling on this? Well, I mean, I, I mean, quite frankly, other than, you know, I thought there was a ball that he should have fielded, obviously, but he's a gutsy kid. You know, he caught two in some windy conditions inside the ten yard line. One time he probably got a little bit out of his element when he caught it on the three, but he ain't, he's not scared now. There's one, there's, yeah, we got some work to do there, but we finally got somebody who, and I'm not saying the other guys were scared, but he loves being in that moment, you know, and I love putting guys out there that want to be there, that relish that opportunity. Yeah, we've got to polish them up a little bit, but uh, I think we got a guy there that uh, is going to be a good player for us. I guess the blocking scheme, it's so difficult to set those things up. Are you kind of under the, I don't know, the, the thought process, like, you know, we're going to make sure we take away a possible fake here first, and then we'll set up the block? We were in four punt safes. We had our defense on. The last thing they want to do is work on hold-up technique, you know. So uh, we had safe punt on four of those kicks out there. It was just the circumstances. And so we're not, we really never got into a return situation. Thanks. Brian, over to you, right? Um, you talked about, you know, bringing the crowd, the crowd noise into practice tonight. What, what else you need to do? Uh, you know, you have three, you're playing three top ten teams on the road this year. What, do, what can you do to make a team, you know, become a good, tough road team? Well, I, I don't think you can do it right now. It's too late. You know, I, I think it's what you do with your team um, in January and February and March and April. And I think you, you build toughness in, in so many ways before you get to the season. And then when you get to the season, you look to see it come together. And, you know, obviously coming back after, you know, really squandering a lead 
at home and, and winning the ball game, you know, is a great indicator of that mental toughness. Um, I think physically we played really hard. So to answer your question, I think we're developing it. I think it's, it's, it's something that we continue to talk about every single day because we knew the schedule we were going into. It's, <laughs> you better be physically tough and mentally tough or you're going to get run out of the stadium. And so I think we're prepared for that and we'll continue to um, challenge our players in practice to give us that, that mental and physical toughness necessary to win games. Do you still say, you know, you got to be, you got to be this on the road, or is it just building toughness for both home and away, or do you focus? Is there something you can focus on as being, you know, this is the way to do when we're away? No, the only thing that I've ever really talked about on the road is maturity, you know, and you know, maturity in, in a sense that, you know, it's it's not a trip to the water park, okay? I don't want a bunch of giggly guys and, you know, hey, we're in a hotel. And, and our guys have been great, but I, I just want a mature group that goes on the road with a focus on what the job is at hand, and that is to, to play their very best. Um, toughness, mental and physical, that's universal, home and away, but just, just a good mature group when you take them on the road. And you talked about how physical this game could be. Is it, does getting Sierra back this week, is that an important factor to have you know, his presence to, to help a running game that maybe didn't quite perform as well as you hoped last week? No, I, I don't think Sear makes the difference in, in the running game. He definitely gives us more weapons on offense that, that we can utilize. And, and we're going to have to do a, a great job as a staff uh, of utilizing him and uh, gives, us, gives us great depth. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, well, Sear's back, you're going to run the ball well this week. I think it just gives us more versatility and, and more, more weapons on offense that, that we can utilize uh, for those, those big chunk plays. Thank you. Brian, what's the biggest concern that you have today that maybe you didn't have a week ago or two weeks ago heading into the season? I don't have one. I don't have a concern that's, that's bigger um, as I stand in front of you that I didn't have last week. Um, we, knew, we knew we were playing a young quarterback. We knew that uh, there was going to be uh, a lot of work that, that needed to go in it week in, week in and week out, and we want to see that improvement. Um, we knew that we were going to play some young guys defensively uh, and that they were going to have to continue to grow. Um, so I think all the things uh, that were quote unquote concerns, if you will, uh, are still there uh, and they just continue to clear themselves up as we play more games. So nothing's happened over the last week that has, has changed uh, my, my thought process as it relates to that. After seeing your team tackle pretty well against Navy, were you scratching your head maybe a little bit at some of what you saw last week? Well, I, I think that we do such a good job of teaching tackling that sometimes you're surprised that, that, that we miss a tackle here or there. But, um, you know, I, I think that as a group, we recognize that um, that's something that we'll continue to um, make sure that we talk about and make sure that we practice and we'll continue to do that this week. There was maybe an initial panic after the Navy game that Notre Dame's cornerback play might get exposed in the games coming up and everything. You had a couple of veteran quarterbacks you were going against last week against Purdue. They seemed to acquit themselves pretty well. Is that how you saw it? Or Yeah. I wasn't panicked. Um, we were in some option defenses that, that stressed us and put some guys in positions that normally they wouldn't be in. You know, we, we felt very comfortable going into the Purdue week that, that we were going to play the kind of pass defense necessary. And, you know, Bennett came up with a couple of interceptions. Kaveri played solid football. We got good play from Elijah Shoemate, uh, broke up a third down conversion opportunity. So. Um, Matthias Farley had to play a ton of football, as you know, uh, when, when uh, Jamoris went down. So uh, all in all, we, we were pleased with their development, but we were confident that as we continue to progress, and, and they're going to get better, and they're not there yet, but we feel like they're, they're the right guys for us, and, and they're going to get the job done. A little bit off topic, but earlier this year, Coach D'Antonio 
got into a little bit of a controversy with his own players with their Twitter remarks after Michigan got beat by Alabama. I was just wondering what your own policy has been. Some coaches have a total ban on it for players during the season. What, how do you approach it? Uh, it's an opportunity for us to talk about positive things. You know, if it's not positive, if it's negative in any way, if, if it's disparaging in remarks, if it's, um, um, if, if it's talking about family business, um, then, then you're going to be warned uh, about how you use Twitter. If it happens again, then, then we'll take immediate action. Um, and our players are very cognizant of the fact that, that Twitter is, a, is an open record and uh, we don't want that kind of content out there. Oh!